Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mazin. Uh, thank you, IC Reach, uh, for the kind invitation. It's an honor uh, and pleasure for me to be here. Uh, before we crack on with this uh, important topic, uh, I would like to have a poll, uh, um, if you like. We want to know um, what do you do currently uh, for uh, assessing fluid responsiveness. So could you please, Dr. Mazin, uh, start uh, uh, the polling and uh, I will see. Okay, uh, uh, Hassan, we have a technical problem with the poll, so why don't you go ahead? Okay, so uh, um, still... yeah, we can we can have it later on in that case. Um, welcome everyone. Fluid responsiveness really is, uh, if you like, an extension to another important uh, topic uh, that we have in our hemodynamic uh, course, hemodynamics for the intensivist, uh, and hopefully in future uh, webinars will expand on uh, on it. Uh, namely, I'm talking about uh, the uh, art of assessing volume status uh, of patients. Today's talk will be mainly uh, directed at patients who are on, uh, the, on who are mechanically ventilated. Uh, however, a few slides will be talking about uh, also spontaneously breathing uh, patient, patients. Um, fluid status uh, assessment, as I said, uh, we this is almost a, a daily challenge uh, for us. And we try to use the windows into the circulation to perfusion. We assess the mental state of the patient, capillary refill time, urine output. Uh, sometimes we use non-invasive tools like uh, on the chest X-ray vascular pedicle width to know whether our patient is hypovolemic or uh, uh, overloaded. Uh, we sometimes use the, inter uh, the inferior vena cava or the echo. Sometimes we use the uh, perfusion indicators like lactate, the central venous oxygen saturation, and CO2 gap. Um, if we have the luxury of uh, pulse control analysis, then we might uh, deploy stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation, uh, and uh, use the effect of passive leg raise test uh, on these parameters. Uh, if our ICU is well equipped, then we might have uh, transpulmonary thermodilation devices like the EV1000 by Edwards or Pico, or even use a cephagial Doppler uh, monitor. And uh, our old friend that is rarely used nowadays, except in RV failures, uh, post lung transplant and cardiac surgeries, is the pulmonary artery catheter or the artery. swan gans. So this is a quick run through of the fluid status assessment. As you can see, it's like a, a jigsaw puzzle and you have to navigate uh, through these uh, pieces to uh, have the complete uh, picture. Right, so what are the objectives of our talk today? Um, why don't we give clues to everyone? Is there any reason we don't do that? Uh, uh, we need to review some physiological background for uh, assessing the fluid responsiveness uh, and what actually we mean by fluid responsiveness. And then we, the core of the talk will be around how to predict fluid responsiveness. So the question is, why don't we give fluids to everyone? Uh, this is a, a famous uh, study, um, included more than 1,100 patients, and it did demonstrate clearly for each one liter increase in the fluid balance, there is 10% increase in mortality within 72 hours. So clearly excessive fluid can be harmful uh, as demonstrated in this study. Another uh, more recent uh, cohort study did demonstrate in more than 23,000 patients uh, that having uh, positive fluid balance uh, or having a fluid balance more than five liters in day one is associated with increase in the mortality by 2.3% for each liter given above, above five liters in day one. So clearly we can see that uh, excessive fluids can be harmful. And really what we are trying to, to achieve is to get to the green zone of hydration uh, status, if you like. So we try to avoid uh, going into the dehydration side uh, or to the overhydration side, because we know that overhydration is associated with organ dysfunction, uh, can lead to increased mortality. But on the other hand, dehydration would lead to tissue perfusion, uh, tissue hypoperfusion and organ dysfunction. Some physiological background, really the heart-lung interaction plays a crucial part 
of assessing the fluid uh, responsiveness. So what happens during heart-lung interaction? We know for spontaneously breathing patients uh, that the, uh, the intrathoracic pressure changes. During inspiration, there is a reduction in the intrathoracic pressure. So the pressure is more negative inside the chest and that leads to gush of blood through the IVC back to the uh, right heart. During expiration, this negative pressure lessens and then that leads to impedance of blood flow back to the heart and that leads to engorgement of the uh, IVC. And this obviously will be a, a continuous cycle and that's how it appears on the ultrasound. We can see clearly during inspiration uh, in this particular uh, uh, photo that there's kissing of the uh, IVC during inspiration. On the other hand, uh, during positive pressure ventilation, during inspiration, there's buildup of uh, or increase in the intrathoracic pressure and that impedes the venous return back to the heart and that leads to engorgement of the IVC, distension of the IVC. And during expiration, the, the intrathoracic pressure will, will drop down and that leads to the forward movement of the blood of the venous return into the heart and collapse of the uh, IVC. And again, this will be a cyclical thing. And on the ultrasound, you clearly will see here uh, distension of the uh, IVC during inspiration. So really, this is really essential to understand uh, a lot of the parameters that we're going to utilize to assess fluid responsiveness. Uh, we know, so now we know that the effect of lung volumes uh, on the heart is mainly mechanical. And this was demonstrated nicely in these pictures. So, uh, could, could you please uh, mute yourself, uh, everyone? Thank you very much. So we know we can see in this uh, CT scans taken, taken during zero PEEP that there is some compression of the uh, heart during inspiration. However, if you apply more PEEP, you can see the compression of the heart with 10 PEEP, you can see the significant compression uh, of the heart inside the cardiac fossa. And this effect or interaction between the heart and the lung has been long established. This article from 1983, and you can see that they depicted for you here the uh, arterial waveform, and you can see at the bottom here, you see the esophageal uh, waveform as well as the ventilator uh, waveform. And you can see with each breath, there is a decline in the, uh, in the blood pressure. And as I can see, there is a swing, arterial swing. And if you pause the uh, respiration in expiration, you can see that this swing disappeared. So this was, as I said, established long time ago, and that formed the basis for a lot of the tools that we have uh, nowadays. Uh, this study uh, studied the changing the intrathoracic pressure and its effect on the, uh, on the uh, uh, blood pressure. And again, we can see with increasing the airway pressure, uh, the swing in the arterial pressure increases. And uh, I thought this nicely demonstrate the, the heart-lung interaction. So really it's a cyclical uh, thing. The cyclical change in the intrathoracic pressure between inspiration and expiration will lead to swing in the blood flow back to the heart. The blood flow swing back to the heart will lead to swing in the cardiac output. And this will be demonstrated as swing in the arterial waveform and that will lead to change in the blood pressure. Now, what is fluid responsiveness? Uh, what do we mean when we say my patient is likely to be fluid responder? Um, there's so many definitions of fluid responsiveness. Um, I used this article to, uh, and I used their, uh, their uh, definition uh, and I strongly recommend for further information about assessing fluid responsiveness to have this article, I feel like, as a, a good grounding uh, in this topic. So basically we, we are looking at the uh, Frank Starling curve and here we are looking at the effect of administration of fluids on the stroke volume. And they define that the rise in stroke volume by more than 10% uh, 
is widely accepted as an indicator of adequate response to fluid uh, resuscitation. So when you give your patient uh, a certain amount of fluid, uh, or you, if you if you like, you add to the circulation certain amount of volume, and you see why I'm using this term, adding to the circulation, then you, if that led to significant rise in the stroke volume by 10%, then you can safely say, my patient is likely to be fluid responder, so he's likely to benefit from administering uh, uh, fluids. However, if that same amount of uh, volume added to the circulation did not generate uh, adequate uh, increase in the stroke volume, more than 10%, then it's unlikely or less likely that my patient would benefit from having uh, further uh, volume loading. Uh, something to be mindful of uh, that the failing heart, the patient reaches to, this, to the flat portion of the Frank Stanley curve earlier than the normal heart. So that's something you need to be mindful whenever you're dealing with a patient with, the, with heart failure. Right, fluid responsiveness in ICU. We know from so many studies that only about 50% of hemodynamically unstable patients are fluid responsive. So really it's just like flipping a coin when you see a critically unstable patient in the ICU and you wonder, is he going to be fluid responder? It's really just like flipping a coin. Right, so what, what measurements, what types of measurements do we have uh, to assess fluid responsiveness? We have two uh, type of measurements, the static measurements and the dynamic uh, measurements. So under static measurements, so we have the central venous uh, pressure. We can use the pulmonary artery occlusion and pressure using the swine gans. Uh, catheter. We can use the global endiastolic volume. Uh, we can use corrected flow time using the esophageal Doppler monitor, or you can even use the echo to establish the left ventricular endiastolic dimension by echocardiography, or a snapshot of the IVC. It's not the dynamic change of the IVC, it's just a snapshot of the IVC. Whilst on the dynamic uh, measurement side, we have the pulse pressure variation, we have the systolic pressure variation. We can use the stroke volume variation, whether it's measured centrally in the, um, at the aortic level or in the uh, peripheral arteries. We can uh, have the velocity time integral of the aorta uh, with the effect of pass blood grace test on it. Uh, we can uh, see what's happening with the IVC uh, during uh, inspiration and expiration. Or we can use something called end expiratory occlusion test. And some authors even suggest using the uh, superior vena cava collapsibility. So we're gonna mainly focus on the dynamic measurements today because we know that the static measurements, again, they perform poorly at uh, predicting uh, flow responsiveness. Uh, some of them is literally just like flipping a coin, uh, uh, as we said earlier. Having said that, uh, for CVP, um, when it's low, then the proportion of patients responding to fluids is quite high. So, and what do we mean by low CVP? It's when the CVP five or less. So if your patient's CVP is five or less, then there's good chance they will be fluid responder. Well, not all of them, but there's good chance they will be fluid responder. The higher the, uh, the CVP, the lower the proportion of patients who will be fluid responder. So that's out of the way. We'll move on to the principles of fluid responsiveness uh, assessment. So as we said, we either use the heart-lung interaction derived parameters or we use the response to fluid challenge. And the, uh, basically in the heart-lung interaction, we are assessing the effect of mechanical ventilation on the hemodynamics. And we have uh, a plethora of uh, parameters that we can use to assess that. Or we can use fluid challenge that can be either external fluid challenge or it can be auto transfusion. Uh, and uh, that is um, demonstrated by using the passive leg raise test. Right, we'll move on to the passive leg raise test. So your patient would be in the uh, semi-recombinant position. Uh, he will have an arterial line in situ. 
uh, or better if they have an advanced hemodynamic monitoring uh, device, your patient should be relaxed, uh, doesn't complain of any hips pain. Uh, you put the, the torso flat and raise the uh, foot of the bed uh, to 45 degrees and observe the patient uh, for 30 to 45 seconds. And what do you mean by observing the patient? Usually you are assessing the hemodynamics effect. So ideally you should have hemodynamic monitoring device, something like a pulse contour analysis device or just the arterial line itself. Uh, we can see the effect on, on the circulation by doing that. Uh, the beauty of the passive leg raise test is you are doing an auto transfusion. So transiently, you are allowing a pool of around 300 ml of blood to go back to the central circulation, acting Here's like, acting, oops, acting as a bolus to the patient. But this bolus can be, uh, if you like, the effect of it can be transient because when you put the patient back in the same position, that effect on the heart will disappear. And we can see, uh, or the definition of positive passive leg raise test is uh, as follows. If you have an aortic blood flow uh, measurement uh, by VTI, if it goes by 10%, then that you can be almost certain that my patient is likely to be fluid responder. If the patient has got a device measuring the stroke volume variation, then a change by 10% also is likely to predict fluid responsiveness, as well as pulse pressure variation. Or if your patient on entitled CO2, so the rise in the entitled CO2 by 5% also suggests that my patient is likely to be fluid responder. And finally, um, less accurate, I must say, a uh, blood pressure rise by 10% also suggests that my patient is likely to be uh, a fluid responder. Right. We'll move on to the fluid challenges. And really what you are trying to do with fluid challenges is testing the uh, cardiocirculatory system, uh, checking for preload reserve. So basically you are trying to see whether my patient is uh, preload dependent. So by giving them uh, more volume, the cardiac output uh, will increase. And that's what we mean by fluid responsiveness. What types of fluid challenges we have? We have two main types of fluid challenges, either the maxi fluid challenge, uh, which is giving four ml per kg over 15 to 30 minutes, or we have the mini fluid challenge, which is really a tiny dose of fluids, 100 ml of fluids is given over one to two minutes. So the, uh, the four ml per kg, or if you like the maxi, the ordinary, uh, the classic uh, fluid challenge, uh, of 4 ml per kg uh, came out from uh, this study, which demonstrated uh, clearly the proportion of responders increased from 20% in the group of 1 ml per kg to 65% in the group of 4 ml uh, per kg. So they started by giving 1 ml per kg a fluid challenge and reached to 4 ml per kg. And by reaching to 4 ml per kg, they clearly demonstrated or delineated the patients uh, who are fluid uh, responders. And the volume they used ranged between 300 to 500 uh, ml. Whilst the uh, mini uh, fluid challenge, if you like the 100 ml uh, in this study was uh, derived from this study and where they gave 100 ml of colloid over one minute, but at the same time, they were having assessment of the uh, velocity time integral and they called it delta VTI. So if the change was more than 10%, then you can be almost certain that my patient is likely to be fluid responder. And here's demonstration that the best cutoff value for delta uh, velocity time integral when given 100 ml of uh, colloid over one minute was uh, 10%. This study was done uh, mainly on uh, spontaneously breathing patients. Right, moving on to the other, if you like, bulk of uh, measurements that we use to assess the fluid responsiveness, utilizing the heart-lung interaction. And here we have the uh, end expiratory occlusion uh, test in mechanically ventilated patients. Uh, this study uh, more than 11 years uh, old now. 
and uh, I must say it's quite uh, intriguing. Basically, your patient uh, should be mechanically uh, ventilated uh, uh, on 8 ml per kg. Uh, so that would be the baseline for your patient. So do we have the Paul uh, Mazin? It seems... Uh, Yes, you can. Is the poll working? Okay. So shall we pause and uh, just uh, have a look at the poll, please, everyone? Uh, if you'd like to answer this poll, we meant to have it at the start of the session. And uh, we'll see by the end of the session with, whether uh, your, your approach is uh, included in our uh, talk today. So please go ahead, everyone, and submit your answers to these two questions. Okay, excellent. So quite a few of you use passive Legrace test. Um, fewer people use the SVV and PPV, a quarter of you. And then we have 17% uh, using the fluid challenge. It's good to see some people still using the CVP. I hope these people are using it when it's low as we uh, alluded earlier on. Um, interesting that no one is using the end expiratory occlusion test and I'm hope hopefully I will convince you all to use more of it. Uh, we are talking about it right now. Then moving on to the second question, which of the following is your preferred fluid challenge? So some people using 100 ml, the majority using the 4 ml per kg and uh, no one is using higher uh, volume. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mazin, and uh, to you all for uh, uh, sharing with us this. So uh, it's quite timely that we were talking about or about to talk about the end expiratory occlusion test. As I said, this is a landmark study which was done uh, or published in 2009 on mechanically ventilated patients. So at the baseline, uh, your patient would be uh, receiving 8 ml per kg tidal volume and is connected to a continuous cardiac output monitoring device, either a pulse contour or better uh, transponder thermal dilution device. And then you do expiratory hold, just like you are assessing for uh, auto peep. So you press the expiratory hold bu button for 15 seconds. And during that time, you are monitoring the effect of that on the cardiac output. And so the positive test will be, if you notice there's increase in the cardiac output by 5%. If that happens, then uh, you usually, uh, the, the drop uh, of cardiac output at the end of the experiment. So after you complete, the cardiac output will go back to baseline. So it's more or less similar to what we did with the passive Legrace test. We are not giving any extra volume from outside, we are just, utilizing the heart lung interaction mechanism uh, to assess the effect um, of expiratory hold. And if you notice there is an increment in the cardiac output by 5% or more, then you go ahead and give your patient a fluid bolus and here you observe the positive effect on the cardiac uh, output. Here, this is from the study itself and you can see clearly during the expiratory hold, there was significant rise in the, uh, in the blood pressure. And for these patients, they administered fluids here, and you can see that the cardiac output further improved uh, after volume expansion. Uh, the uh, ROC, the area under the curve, was excellent, really very impressive for uh, this test and you can see reaching to 0.95 uh, when the threshold value used 5%. And that also uh, seen on the effect on the cardiac index. So you have the effect on uh, pulse pressure and the effect 
better or better demonstrated in the cardiac index with the ROC area of 0.97 and to lesser extent, less precise, if you like, the effect on the systolic blood pressure, where we can see that the threshold needed here is 4%. So clearly in expiratory occlusion test, one of the, if you like, tools that you can uh, deploy during your daily rounds in ICU. And it's very quick uh, and can give you the answer whether my patients like to be fluid responder or not pretty quickly. Right, something to mention, does the end expiratory occlusion test or the passive grace test get affected by the lung compliance? Uh, it's good to know that the, both the PLR, passive grace test and end expiratory occlusion test uh, did not affect that much, did not get affected that much by the uh, change in the lung compliance, contrary to the pulse pressure uh, variation, which showed that uh, when the lung compliance drops, when you have a patient with the stiff lungs, then the variation is li less likely to be demonstrated. Right, moving on uh, to, the, to another uh, tool, which is the pulse pressure uh, variation. So basically you are measuring the pulse of pressure, the maximum pulse of pressure. You're taking away from it the minimum pulse of pressure and dividing the results by the pulse of pressure uh, mean. And here in this study, they demonstrated a value of 13%. So if you have a pulse of pressure variation of 13%, you can be almost certain, I should say, that your patient is likely to be fluid uh, responder. And remember, the higher the value of the pulse of pressure variation, the higher the likelihood that your patient is going to be fluid responder. Uh, you need to remember that your patient ideally should be receiving 8 ml per kg tidal volume, and also they should have sinus uh, rhythm. Having said that, if my patient is receiving protective lung ventilation strategy, and still they are getting a pulse of pressure variation of 13 or above, then they are likely, highly likely to be a fluid responder as well. And you can see that the performance of this test is quite uh, impressive. The other parameter is stroke volume variation. Uh, and there's so many studies that uh, studied this uh, at the, uh, around two decades ago. And basically it's more or less the same as the pulse pressure variation, but all here we are looking at the area under the, uh, the arterial waveform, and we are measuring the maximum stroke volume, taking away from it the minimum st stroke volume divided by the stroke volume mean. And, and uh, this is usually calibrated over 30 seconds and a cutoff or a threshold of 10% or more usually indicates that my patient is likely to be a fluid uh, responder. Right, as I mentioned with the pulse pressure variation, similar uh, conditions apply to stroke volume variation. Your patient must be passively breathing on the uh, ventilator. The patient must be in sinus rhythm. And really the higher the variation percentage, the higher the likelihood of responsiveness to fluid loading. Right, uh, moving on to spontaneously breathing patients. Uh, this study was done on spontaneously breathing patients and they used the velocity time integral to assess the effect of passive leg raise test on the uh, VTI. And here they used the, um, the VTI as a surrogate to the uh, stroke volume. And uh, they found the cutoff of 12% uh, usually indicates fluid uh, responsiveness. Um, our friend, Fia Vinakeva, a lot of you uh, use uh, uh, IVC assessment uh, during ward rounds. Uh, and we have two types of uh, Fia Vinakeva assessment. We have a static measurements and we have dynamic uh, measurements of the uh, IVC. What I'm talking about today mainly is the dynamic assessment of the IVC. So looking at the collapsibility uh, IVC index or the if the patient is mechanically ventilated is the distensibility, distensibility um, IVC index. So in mechanically ventilated patients, 
if the IVC, maximum IVC diameter minus the minimum IVC diameter divided by the mean is more than 15%, then your patient is likely to be fluid responder. For spontaneously breathing patients, whether they are on the vent or without ventilator, this has to be a lot higher to predict fluid uh, responsiveness. And here we can see the area under the curve. So it's more reliable in mechanically ventilated patients. So dynamic assessment of the uh, IVC, uh, we call it distensibility IVC index, is more reliable in mechanically ventilated patients compared to the spontaneously breathing patients where we call it the collapsibility IVC uh, index. Um, a word of caution that when you are doing it on a spontaneously breathing patient, this study showed that uh, the distance from the uh, right atrium uh, did improve the accuracy of this test. And really the further you are from the uh, well, not the further, if you stick to four centimeters distance from the uh, right atrium, then the performance of the test uh, quite improved. So really they said the best predictor of fluid responsiveness was uh, collapsibility index of 44% during standard breathing measured at four centimeter from the entrance of the IVC to the right atrium. Uh, another uh, tool back to our Oh, very old friend of CVP measurement. And uh, this study assessed the performance of change or vi respiratory variation of the right atrial pressure, uh, due, uh, assessing the respiratory variation of the CVP. Uh, and in this study, uh, these, for example, these patients demonstrating some drop in the CVP during inspiration, as you can see here whilst this patient did not show any change in the, uh, or no correlation with the respiratory cycle. And for those who did have a drop in the uh, CVP by one millimercury or more, majority of them did respond to fluid uh, loading. So again, CVP can be a dynamic tool if you pay attention to the waveform and see if there is significant drop uh, or variation during respiration, then that might indicate that, that your patient is likely to be a fluid responder. Uh, I thought this table uh, will summarize a lot of what we mentioned already. And I tried to, uh, if you like, uh, populate the, uh, the performance of each test. I put the threshold for each test to predict fluid responsiveness uh, as and you can see here the static tests, really, the CVP, coronary artery occlusion pressure performed really uh, badly. Right. Now, we need to know that not every fluid responsive patient must receive fluids. And that's really just to say, take a holistic approach to your patient. The fact your patient has got a CVP of, of three or or even a zero, doesn't necessarily mean that you should go ahead and give them fluids. If the patient is perfectly perfusing well with normal lactate, uh, perfusion indicators are good, blood pressure is okay, why would you go and, and give fluids? Be mindful of giving excessive fluids because we know that as we demonstrated earlier, that excessive fluids is associated with increased uh, mortality. Now, this is a crucial question. How do you know that your patient uh, had uh, adequate fluid uh, response? Then you, again, as we said, you look at the jigsaw puzzle. Is the perfusion indicators in my patient had improved? The lactate is coming down. The base excess deficit is improving. Uh, have I seen improvement in the hemodynamics readings, the MAP, uh, mean arterial pressure, the cardiac output? All these, if they are improving, then it's clearly that my patient is responding to fluids. Um, when do you stop uh, giving fluids? Obviously you need to observe for potential side effects of fluid. So if you see that your patient is getting uh, soft tissue or interstitial edema, if you see that your patient is tipped to heart failure as demonstrated by dropping the cardiac output or development of pulmonary edema, 
uh, or if your patients start in becoming acidotic, as happens with when you give excessive uh, 0.9 uh, sodium chloride, 0.9 percent sodium chloride, your patient might end up having hyperchloremia or develop a wet lungs as demonstrated by uh, external lung water index. All these parameters should alert you to stop administering uh, fluids. So the question in a practice, is my patient like to be fluid responsive? If you are sure, then go ahead and give fluids. And if you are sure that my patient is unlikely to be fluid responsive, then stop and do not give fluids. However, if you are not sure, then try to uh, deploy some of the tools that we talked about. You can give fluid challenge and this fluid challenge can be in the form of um, mini fluid challenge. It can be the classical fluid challenge. Ideally, you should use 4 ml per kg or you can just give them uh, auto transfusion if you like, uh, pass blood rest test, or you can deploy one of the dynamics tests that we talked about that utilizes the heart-lung interaction to, if you like, confirm to you that my patient is uh, likely to be fluid responder uh, or not, whether my patient is going to benefit from administering uh, fluids or not. So we reach to the conclusion. So prediction of fluid responsiveness is an art, and is a daily challenge in ICU. The positive fluid response is the action that increases stroke volume by more than 10%. Dynamic tests are far better than static tests to predict fluid responsiveness. And always be mindful of the preconditions for each test. For example, a mechanically ventilated patients with a volume of more than 8 ml for most of the dynamic tests, if you like, namely the pulse pressure variation, the stroke volume variation, the IVC dynamic assessment. And don't forget, passive leg rest test is quite handy, easy to do. I can give you the answer within seconds and without exposing your patient to unnecessary uh, fluids administration. However, not every predicted fluid responsive patient needs to be given intravenous fluids. As I said, always have a holistic approach to your patients. With this, we'll stop and take any questions. Uh, good, we saved a couple of minutes. <laughs> the mic is yours, uh, Mazen. We'll take the questions. So I relaunched uh, the uh, poll, if you see it. Excellent. Yeah, it's good to see if. Okay. Uh, so we're collecting responses right now. Please go ahead so and please uh, answer those those two questions. Well, uh, it looks promising. Actually, we start to see some. Uh, responses regarding regarding the end expiratory exclusion test occlusion test excellent it seems your internet connection is faster than mine because i've not seen the results yet <laughs> well i'm seeing them on the admin side <laughs> oh i see that's why okay that's good to know. so let's uh end it and share the results right now okay fantastic so more people doing passive leg rest test, excellent. Less fluid challenge. A lot more doing end expert occlusion test. Fantastic, thank you very much everyone. That's really great. I really hope that more of you will do the end occlusion test in real life and you'll see how beauty it is. A lot of trainees surrounding with me, they will see me doing the expiratory hold every now and then uh, to assess fluid responsiveness. And for those who have the luxury of having equipments that do the stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation, then that's great. Uh, I must say in some of the hospitals in England, I've seen the usual monitors, literally the usual monitors is measuring for you the PPV and the SPV. Moving on to the second question. So yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. If you're gonna give fluid bolus, please go ahead and give the form L per kg not 500, not 250, be more precise and see according to the patient's uh, weight. If you have the echo, then probably you can use the mini uh, fluid challenge. 
great well done Thank you very much, uh, Hassan. Uh, uh, really a fantastic way uh, of, uh, present of your presentation for this uh, challenging topic, actually. The main purpose for this uh, uh, presentation was to talk about the uh, uh, end expiratory occlusion test because I think we need to accommodate it in our practice more and more. I have a quick question, then I will hand it to Dr. Uh, uh, Al Muthanna. He's got uh, uh, a question. So, uh, Hassan, what's the best way to measure the cardiac output? I know that you need a precise and accurate uh, uh, real-time way to measure the cardiac output. And uh, related to that, can we go with the pulse variation? Fantastic question. Thank you very much, uh, Mazen. It really depends uh, on your patient. So, if you have somebody receiving uh, high doses of vasopressors, then I'm afraid the pulse control analysis devices are not that accurate and you need something more reliable. And here comes transponary thermal deletion devices, namely the EV1000 uh, or the PICO. These are quite accurate. They are utilizing the thermal deletion uh, technique that is used uh, also in the strand GANs. And they are pretty accurate in giving you data. Uh, the problem with that, they are quite intermittent. So that's why you combine with these devices the pulse contour analysis. So the EV1000 has two major parameters, and hopefully in future webinars we will talk about this more. You have the pulse contour analysis calibrated to the thermal dilution readings. I think that would be the best. If you have someone quite acquainted with ECHO, then again, that will be an, a handy tool to utilize uh, during uh, ICU rounds. Uh, however, that senior or that person who is uh, qualified to use the echo is not available at the bedside all the time to give us, uh, if you like, uh, continuous cardiac output uh, monitoring. So it really depends on your patient, but I would go for the thermal deletion, uh, transponary thermal deletion devices. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hassan. So we do have some questions on, uh, in the chat sec uh, section. Please, if you have any question, forward it to us in the chat session section, or uh, raise your hand. I'll give you the mic. Uh, Muthanna, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for the nice lecture. Uh, my question is about the practice that uh, sometimes we do. As you know, um, most of our patients not on 8 ml per kg uh, tidal volume. So uh, in order to, to uh, apply these uh, you know, methods uh, for uh, cardiac output monitoring, uh, temporarily increasing the tid uh, tidal volume from 6 ml or so up to 8 ml for like a minute or two, then you know, test uh, uh, the numbers and maybe give the challenge and then uh, you know, come back and redo that. So temporarily changing the tidal volume. Is that practice supported or accepted in your opinion? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, Dr. Mutana. Thank you very much for this great question. Um, I didn't want to confuse people uh, with more studies, but yeah, definitely that's a well-known practice. So if you are utilizing the protective lung ventilation strategy and your patient on 6 ml per kg and your pulse pressure variation or your patient's pulse pressure variation is not where it should be to indicate fluid responsiveness, so yeah, go ahead and put the patient on 8 ml per kg and see. And if the patient barely touching 13, you are not sure, go ahead and increase it to 10 ml. So there is a great study showing that the gray zone area for pulse pressure variation. And to overcome this gray zone area, you go ahead and increase the tidal volumes to see if that leads to meaningful change in the and the uh, pulse pressure variation. Remember what we said that the pulse pressure variation doesn't perform as well in stiff lung patients. So that's why you might have to use higher tidal volumes to ascertain whether my patient is uh, going to be fluid responder or not. So there's a question on the chat. Is there any studies to predict the fluid responsiveness in mechanically ventilated patients with less than 8 ml uh, per kg? Um, so if you are talking about the pulse pressure variation, the stroke volume variation, the IVC, all of these studies really suggested that you use 8 ml per kg to be certain that your patient is not fluid responder, as Dr. Mefana alluded. So you just go ahead and change the tidal volume to uh, 
8 ml and observe the effect because the effect will be instantaneous. So the moment you change the, the final volume to 8 ml, if your patient is likely to be fluid responder, then you will see that effect immediately on the, on the screen. So uh, till we get more questions, Hassan, uh, uh, I think it's uh, very important to consider more than one way of assessment. So we should not rely on a single way. You can see that each uh, uh, methodology has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and uh, don't forget our, also that uh, our uh, uh, clinical assessment is also important uh, uh, in determination uh, whether we should give uh, uh, fluids or not. Uh, can you uh, comment on that more? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, Mazen. Thank you very much. As we said, really, during the lecture, you must have a holistic approach to your patient. We started by the jigsaw puzzle for volume assessment. That really applies also to uh, assessing uh, fluid responsiveness. Don't rely on single test to say my patient is really going to be fluid responder and you go ahead and, uh, and just do it. Try to uh, accommodate the clinical assessment, uh, clinical examination. Go ahead and touch your patient. Assess the peripheral uh, uh, circulation, capillary recall time the skin temperature gradient. Uh, these are simple tools, but well validated. Go and read right. about uh, the re patient results. Is the lactate elevated? Is it going in the wrong direction? Face excess, especially in trauma patient. Is it high? Can I improve it by giving fluids to my patients? So try really to take a holistic approach before you make a decision about giving uh, intravenous fluids uh, to your patient. And if the upstream markers, the downstream markers are all good, there's no reason to push for fluids. Remember, fluid is a drug and can be harmful if it was misused. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, are you relying on uh, uh, capillary, capillary refill uh, to determine uh, adequate perfusion for those patients uh, or you're measuring the lactic acid? Is there anything to support one way or the other? Uh, indeed, that's another great question. Hopefully, we'll tackle it in uh, future webinars, Mazen, inshallah, ta'ala, about volume assessment. But yeah, the Andromeda shock study did show that by utilizing simple parameters like capillary refill time, the peripheral skin temperature, uh, did perform really as almost, almost, I should say, as good as uh, doing lactate uh, on your patients. So yes, they are quite, quite important. Excellent. So, Dr. Uh, Hassan, uh, let me give you the mic so you can actually explain uh, your question in a better way. I'm not fine. Can you raise your hand here? I found it. Yeah, go ahead. Alaikum. Alaikum. Dr. Hassan. So, yeah. My question is why we're not looking instead of increasing the tidal volume to 8 ml to do studies with 6 ml but we're changing in the parameters like the pulse pressure variation instead of using cut of 13 percent maybe by studies it proved to be 15 or 16 and instead of mm -hmm. playing with the mechanical ventilation why we're not working on the parameters mm -hmm. itself on 6 ml because this is what we use for all patients 6 ml not 8 ml that's, that's quite a tough question, <laughs> but I suspect the answer lies in the uh, precision of these devices that we are using. These devices, when you are utilizing them, they detect the differences in different ways. So uh, I suspect, and I'm, I'm sorry, I can't explain it in more details, but it all depends on the precision of the method or the tool that you are using to detect the difference uh, in these patients. Hassan, you're 100% right. Uh, uh, there's a variability uh, in testing between uh, one method to another, and with repeated uh, measurements of the same uh, device, uh, there is a variation also. So uh, to answer your question, Dr. Hassan, if you go down to 5% or 6%, this is a normal variation from one measurement to another. So you won't be able to detect an important variation if you lower it down lower than 10 or 12%. But this is a great okay. question, actually. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, any other questions? Uh, 
if not, uh, you know what, uh, uh, Al Musanna, uh, we're uh, not using end uh, expiratory uh, occlusion test. Do you think that uh, uh, we should uh, do it more often? Uh, me and Mutanna work at the same hospital here. And uh, I think, you know, my personal opinion that uh, we probably should uh, uh, do it uh, more frequently and uh, accommodate it as uh, a, a way of assessment of fluid uh, responsiveness. Go ahead. I think, yes, I think we should integrate it as, uh, in our uh, way to assess, you know, it will be an additional information. I, uh, you know, in physiology, it sounds great. And uh, I think as we practice it more, we will have more uh, insight about it. Excellent. So any last words? Uh, and so, uh, it's clear, it's really nice to see when you do that uh, maneuver on this on the vent, and you're looking at the monitor mm -hmm. and the nurse will ask you, what are you looking at? And it's just like a, you're performing magic in front of nurses or those who are not acquainted with the heart lung interaction. So it's quite nice. I think it's really important. Um, thank you very much all for uh, having me, for being with us today. And inshallah, your pa patients will benefit from uh, uh, you, what you've learned today. And I look forward to seeing you in future webinars, inshallah. Yeah, I would like to ask uh, uh, you to join uh, uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Hawa's uh, group on ICU REACH. He's moderating uh, hemodynamic group and a lot of uh, uh, high level information. You can find it on that group. Uh, so please uh, register to the uh, icu.com website uh, and uh, join uh, uh, the uh, hemodynamic groups for more information. I think we're going to be having <clears throat> more uh, uh, webinars and meetings about uh, hemodynamics in, in the future. So please uh, stay tuned uh, on our website to uh, uh, see when we're going to have the next one. At the same time, I want to invite uh, uh, you and your residents uh, to our next uh, mechanical uh, ventilation uh, uh, online uh, simulation course that's going to be um, held on uh, January 4th, uh, 5th and 6th. It's going to be uh, daily at nine o'clock till 11 o'clock uh, Riyadh time. And uh, we will uh, 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 talk about uh, basics of uh, mechanical ventilation, principles of mechanical ventilation, in addition to modes and clinical applications. So I uh, hope that uh, if uh, somebody would like to learn more about mechanical ventilation, uh, join that course. Uh, and uh, also I would like to invite everyone to be uh, uh, a, uh, uh, participant at uh, our uh, uh, activities on icureach.com. Uh, please log into the website, register, and you can download so many, uh, so much information uh, for free. Uh, appreciate your time, Hassan. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this great uh, webinar, uh, great information. Uh, I think this is uh, the purpose of uh, uh, you're fulfilling the mission of ICU Reach by changing practices of critical care physicians around the world. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, whoever you are, uh, wherever you logged from, I think we have people from Saudi Arabia, uh, other areas in the Middle East, uh, United States, and uh, uh, as far as I see, Pakistan and India also. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, right. Looking forward to seeing you for uh, future uh, webinars, uh, and uh, uh, have a good night. Thank you very much. All the best. <laughs>